This is Health Call Online, the place for extended versions of interviews you hear on our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour, now heard on more stations around the country as they join the Health Call Radio Network. Talking today about a problem that is increasing in its severity, and that is hearing loss and how that relates to dementia. Millions of Americans suffer hearing loss, kind of a common part of aging, but few do much about it, and that increases their risk of suffering the symptoms of dementia. Now, however, there is a new type of product on the market, over-the-counter hearing aids, that might be able to blunt the impact of all of this. So I wanted to connect with someone who can guide us in the right direction, and that is Barbara Kelly. She's executive director of the Hearing Loss Association of America. You find them online at hearingloss.org. Barbara, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I am really interested in this connection between hearing loss and dementia. Let's talk about what we know and what we don't know. First, what is the connection? What's going on here? Well, that's something we have to be very careful about. We hear a lot in the media. There are comorbidities with untreated hearing loss, being isolation, anxiety, depression, falls. You know, falls are the number one reason that older people end up in the emergency room. And now cognitive decline. And when people hear there's a link, um, people think there's a cause and effect. Mm -hmm. If you have hearing loss, you're going to have cognitive decline or uh, worse that if you don't treat your hearing loss, it's going to lead to cognitive decline. But that isn't exactly true. And people have to be very careful about how they interpret this research. Um, By treating hearing loss, you can mitigate the risk of cognitive decline, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. So it's not a cause and effect. So um, we have to be very careful about how we talk about that subject. But um, definitely there have been studies where uh, people have gone into nursing homes where there were seniors there who were thought to have cognitive decline, but they really had hearing loss. They Hmm. weren't hearing the conversation, they weren't being involved, they weren't being engaged, and then they were given hearing aids, and all of a sudden, they don't have cognitive decline. And, you know, we do know a lot now about, uh, the Surgeon General just came out with how loneliness and isolation is a health risk. And we know that that does lead to, um, now, you know, does it lead to cognitive decline? Well, it certainly gets you out of being engaged and active with others. And we know that that is uh, a good thing to do to try to prevent cognitive decline. So we have to be really careful when we talk about this link with hearing loss and cognitive decline, because there's yet a lot of research to be done. Yeah, the evidence strong though. I let me let me just get this number correct and let me just double check here. A study found that according to participants with normal hearing, people with hearing loss that do not use hearing aids had a 42% higher risk of all cause dementia. So that says if I'm untreated in my hearing loss, I've got a pretty big increased chance that I'm going to face some type of cognitive decline. Not that there's a connection, as you said, not cause and effect, but certainly something's going on. Do we know what that something is? Have we nailed down why there seems to be that link? No, not yet. And there will be more researches, research out there. Some of the, the theories that are there is that your brain is doing so much work to hear, to process auditorily, that it's it's compensating, and maybe that takes away from other parts of the cognitive process. Now, I'm not a physician, so that's put mm-hmm. in very simple layman's terms. Mm-hmm. And the other part is that because hearing loss does lead to isolation, people withdraw when it becomes too hard to communicate. Yeah. And we know that being isolated, I think there is a a link there with cognitive decline. So like I said, the science really needs to um, play out. It needs to be uh, put out there carefully and interpreted carefully so people don't think there is a cause and effect. But it's certainly an interesting topic and one that's being studied and we should pay attention to. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, in addition to being a health nerd, I'm kind of a technology geek. So I think of this in computer terms. My computer CPU has only so much energy, and if I have to spend it running uh, Windows plus Word plus Excel plus all these things, it's got less horsepower to do other work. And it sounds like the brain might be functioning kind of that same way. If my brain's already a little bit diminished, now it has to work harder to understand and perceive what's going on around me, I'm less capable. So that that kind of makes sense to me in that that's, way. And that's part of the research and the theories that's, that's being done. So we're really looking closely at that. Uh, I think what we have to look for is if people who are considering a hearing aid see any type of advertising out there that says, uh, get a hearing aid or you're going to get cognitive decline. You know, that that type of advertising is wrong and it's misleading. So that's where this research and the misinterpretation of it could be dangerous or um, stigma. You know, what if we mm -hmm. start assuming that, that somebody who has hearing loss just automatically has cognitive decline and we already put that stigma on them. So we have to be really careful about how we talk about it, but we're going to look carefully at the research and we're going to certainly pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. You, I want to go back to something you said just moments ago, and that is there is an association between fall risk and hearing loss. Tell me more about that, because that's that's a significant issue, as you said. Yes, it, it probably has something to do with balance and hearing loss, but uh, a comorbidity of hearing loss is higher incidence of falls. And we know that that's the number one reason that older people, many older people have hearing loss, go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, very important to pay attention to as well. What is going on with the fact that people, uh, a low percentage of people with hearing loss actually do something about it? Is that, is that the stigma thing you talked about? Is it just refusing to admit that I'm getting old? It's, it's a lot of things. It's a great question. Is uh, We know that people take about five years from the time that they learn they have a hearing loss to actually taking that step to getting hearing aids. You know, a lot can happen in that five years. You know, if you're in your working years, some people get very frustrated and they leave the job. They start withdrawing from the things they love to do, uh, family events, because it just becomes too hard to communicate and too hard to hear. And, you know, all our relationships, uh, whether it's work or home or family, depend on hearing. That's how we build our relationships. Mm -hmm. So... People take their time. There are a number of reasons. One of them is stigma. Having hearing aids somehow over time is related to being old. But, you know, I think putting in a hearing aid is a lot less conspicuous as asking people to repeat, bluffing, right. misinterpreting. I mean, that yeah. kind of makes you look old as well. Yeah. Um, so there is that stigma. Oftentimes, people get stopped right at their primary care providers. You know, if they're over 50 and they start saying, you know, I think I'm starting to have a hearing loss, very often they're told, don't do anything about it till it gets worse, which mm. is very bad advice. They're told there's nothing you can do about it. They're told it's a normal part of aging. So people tend to listen to their healthcare providers mm -hmm. and they often get stopped right there. Uh, some people, it's access to care. It's they yeah. don't have an easy way to get to an audiologist or a hearing instrument specialist to get um, tested and treated. You know, there's uh, only, we're gonna guess like 12,000 practicing audiologists in the country and they're largely around urban areas. Mm -hmm. So if you're out in a rural area, you might not have that access to care. And some people it is cost. Medicare doesn't cover hearing aids. Uh, Medicare Advantage, some plans do. And sometimes people aren't even aware of that. Some health insurance plans do, but mostly for adults, hearing aids remain uncovered. But hearing aids do vary in price. You know, anywhere from a couple thousand dollars for two, you know, up to seven, eight thousand dollars. And it depends on the features. But I also like to remind people that that hearing aid is just about a third of the cost, where it's the audiological services that are built into that, that are bundled into that, you know, the 
testing, the fitting, the care, the cleaning, the follow-up, uh, which is especially important. So we have come through, you know, this huge technological advance in the past few years. I wear a pair of noise reducing earbuds when I'm mowing the lawn. Allows me to listen to a podcast and also block out some noise at the same time. So it's a win-win. So we've got that technology that is fantastic. Um, now that's come a step forward and over-the-counter hearing aids kind of borrow from that technology and they're much more affordable. What are you hearing from the field about how this new generation of hearing aids are working out? Right. And those um, earbuds that you wear, I wear a pair myself, um, technically could be called an over-the-counter hearing aid, but they don't mm -hmm. brand them as that. You know, they're, they're knocking out the background noise. I use mine with the phone that gives direct audio connection with Bluetooth and the sound is so clear. And yeah, when you so start having a mild to moderate hearing loss, you know, hearing on the phone is one of the first things that you, people have difficulty with. That's one of the first signs. So some people just aren't ready to wear hearing aids seven days a week, eight hours a day. But some of these over-the-counter devices can be for situational hearing or hearing enhancement they could be a first step into paying attention to your hearing and sound quality. So the FDA did open up a new market of over-the-counter hearing aids last fall. And this specifically is for adults only with self-perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. And they are meant to be self-fitting without the help of a hearing care professional. So let me, let me stop you there for just a second. So you're saying that if I think I have a hearing loss, I'm pretty sure I do, um, and I just want to try this, I can do that on my own. I've seen them at Costco and you can get them on Amazon. That seems kind of sketchy to me, but you tell me what you think. Are, is this working well, out well for people? Well, you know, I have to tell you, it's like day one of the market almost. We haven't seen it really play out. Um, electronics companies are producing some of these over-the-counter devices. And what we had before the FDA opened the market was something called PSAPs, personal sound amplification products. Mm -hmm. And these were not allowed by law to be marketed to people with hearing loss. So they were marketed for recreational purposes. Some of those devices have are now, I'll say, good enough, and they have crossed over into the over-the-counter market. But, you know, I have to tell you, it's really with the consumer, the buyer beware. If you're buying something for $19.99, you're probably not going to get any kind of help. Right. And we tell people to read the information on the box, and they have to say it's an over-the-counter hearing aid. That's by regulation that the FDA puts on that. There has to be a return policy on the box if the manufacturer gives one. And we highly recommend that there is a return policy because putting a hearing device in your ears to help with hearing, it takes a while to adjust. You know, your brain has to adjust to these. This auditory processing system has to adjust. Unlike when most of us put on a pair of glasses, it really does correct our vision. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of adjustment period, but it's not so much the same with the hearing aid. Hearing aids are terrific and they help, but there is uh, an adjustment period. We're seeing from consumers that especially these devices that are online, uh, there's some false advertising out there. They're saying that they're over the counter hearing aids when they're not. They're not giving all the information because you can't see the box mm -hmm. and they're not giving the box information. So the market is very new. I think that it's going to take a couple years to play out. And it's also one thing to have products, but it's another thing to have consumer uptake. We're really positive. The Hearing Loss Association of America is positive about over-counter the hearing aids because we see it as another pathway to care. The traditional pathway to care is you go through a hearing health care provider, and that could be an audiologist or a hearing instrument specialist. You have your hearing tested, and they're the gatekeepers to the technology. This is another pathway to care for some people. 
And it doesn't have to be an either or. I mean, I think you should, if you really want to know what your hearing level is, go get your hearing tested, find out. And then if you want to try an over-the-counter device, try it. Um, I also caution if it doesn't work for you, don't give up. Um, it might not be the right device. You know, you might choose another over-the-counter device or you might need need a little bit more help from a hearing health care professional. And so that's why just, the return yeah. policy is important, right? Yes, I mean, yes. Exactly. I want to get to what these hearing devices do. Do they just amplify sound? Do they shape sound in some way to make it easier for me to hear? How do I know that I'm finding the device that's right? What are some of those phrases or technologies I should look for? Well, without the help of a hearing health care professional, um, some of them do have some online help that you can get. Well, like you said, you use these earbuds that block mm -hmm. out background noise. So some of the devices do that. Uh, some of them are controlled by an app on your phone that allows you to lower the background noise, increase somebody's volume. So that's another important thing. Look on the box is, does the device need to be used with a smartphone? Now, for you and me, we have smartphones. We're used to fiddling with apps. But maybe if you're a senior, uh, you're not yeah. quite comfortable with that, or you might not even have a smartphone. So that's important to look for as well. If I am satisfied with these devices and they seem to be working well enough, is there any advantage to seeking out professional help in making them even better? Are there audiologists who are going to work with these over-the-counter products? Do they sell over-the-counter products themselves? But that's a good question. Um, some of them are, are going to. Um, some of them are going to unbundle their prices. So if they have somebody who comes in and might need a little help with an over-the-counter, they would provide a fee for service. And really, since most hearing loss is progressive, I think a enlightened hearing healthcare professional would help somebody at the beginning stages of the mm -hmm. hearing loss mm -hmm. and then be with them all along the way. And the chances are they're going to end up with more sophisticated technology and need more help. So I am about 66 years old. I think my hearing's okay. You just suggested we should have a hearing test anyway. What is that going to cost typically? What am I going to learn? How does that process work? Well, you can have hearing screenings. Um, sometimes they're often for free, you know, offered for free. I know at our, our walk for hearing, we're in 20 cities at some of our walks. The Lions Club and Sertoma Clubs and some audiology divisions of universities will screen for free. That's a good indicator. Um, if the screening indicates that you should go for a further audiological evaluation, uh, you should do that. Medicare does cover complete audiological evaluations with the referral of a doctor. They don't pay for hearing devices, but they will cover that. Some insurances cover it. My uh, physician, as part of my annual physical, I get a hearing screening. Hmm. And it's amazing. And it's great. And that doesn't happen with every physician. But if you... Um, really feel that there are some, you know, symptoms that you can hear, but you can't understand the words, you're turning up the volume, background noise is trouble, the phone's trouble. And I think the most important indicator is if your family and friends are telling you, you can't hear, there's a pretty good chance that, yeah. you know, it might not be a problem for you, but it's certainly a problem for them. And that's reason enough to get something done because of that social isolation is exactly. only going to increase and get worse. Man, I am so on board with that. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much for telling us more about all of this. If uh, your website has a number of helpful tools, and so I'll direct people to your website. Again, it is hearingloss.org and uh, can point you in lots of different directions and to some professionals who can help you get through this mess and hopefully avoid any chance that hearing loss is going to increase your risk of dementia. So again, Barbara Kelly, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Lee. And just remember that hearing health is a major health concern. We have to pay attention to it as long as, uh, you know, everything else in our body, we should also pay attention to our hearing. I appreciate being here today.